I'm Amy Newmark. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of Chicken Soup for the Soul. And I'm here today with four of my absolute favorite authors, four wonderful doctors from Harvard Medical School who have collaborated with Chicken Soup for the Soul on a new line of books from Chicken Soup for the Soul Health. As our readers know, we have always used stories as a way of motivating, encouraging, inspiring our readers, and as a way for people to find uh, a solution for problems in their lives, a way to improve their lives and the lives of their families. So today we're going to be talking about this new line of books and I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Julie Silver, Dr. Suzanne Coven, Dr. Marie Pazinski, and Dr. Jeff Brown. And I wanted to start by asking Dr. Pazinski, because she is a neurologist, why is storytelling such an effective part of the healing regimen? Storytelling is, is so effective. In fact, I can't think of a better way to convey medical advice than through inspirational stories that promote uh, encouragement. And the, the beauty of, of this approach, from my perspective as a neurologist, is that it's so much easier to remember information when it is related through a story. Because stories make information personally meaningful and emotionally significant, and, and that really makes for, for a lasting memory. Now, Julie, you are an MD who specializes in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Right. How do you use stories? Because your patients are recovering from surgeries or injuries, and they really need some encouragement. One of the things that's so interesting is that they've done studies where they've looked at healing and especially wound healing. And wounds heal faster in people with less stress and in people who are nurtured. And stories are incredibly nurturing. They help us de-stress. They help us um, really physically heal better. They also help us emotionally, of course, but my work is very focused on physical healing. How can we heal faster, better, stronger? Well, that leads us to Dr. Jeff Brown, who is a psychologist at Harvard Medical School because you know all about stress since you wrote our Say Goodbye to Stress book for us. But how do you see that in your practice when you are combining stories with helping people heal mentally and perhaps you're also seeing some physical healing in those patients? Absolutely. <clears throat> I think that um, stories are, are wonderful because they provide uh, facts, they provide an avenue for people who are looking for a way out. Uh, when stress hits us, we, we want to know that somebody else has been able to get through the same thing uh, that we're trying to accomplish. And so that's, that's a key piece uh, for the stories in these books, that they're giving that hope, they're giving a solution, and uh, then we support that with the medical advice that, uh, that is also grounded in research. So it's, it's nice to have an avenue for getting out of the dilemmas that we find ourselves in. Now, Dr. Coven, uh, you specialize in helping people become healthier through fitness, through nutrition. Uh, and you have one of my favorite beliefs, of course, which is that you should never go on a diet and that there's a reasonable amount of chocolate in every day. <laughs> but <laughs> I was wondering, I know that you're a big user of, of support groups for your women who are trying to become more fit. How do you use stories in your practice? Uh, I use uh, stories every day, all day, and I think all of us do, you know, as uh, doctors, one thing we forget sometimes is that storytelling is how we were trained. We didn't call it that. We called it case studies. Uh, we didn't learn about diabetes in some general sense. We learned about individuals with diabetes. Um, so I use it all the time. Just yesterday, I saw a woman who was struggling to articulate for me um, how she felt in menopause. It wasn't quite irritability, it wasn't quite anxiety. She didn't know what to call it and she said, do you have other women who feel kind of like this? And of course I did and I told her about them. And there was so much going on just in that interaction, so powerful. I validated her, I helped her define how she felt and I also made her feel less isolated which is one of the main things I think we do um, in healing people. So you all use stories in your practices on a one-on-one -on -one basis or perhaps on a one-to-a-few basis when you're, when you're handling one of your support groups. But how did it work for you actually writing a book where you got to incorporate your normal medical advice with our Chicken Soup for the Soul stories? 
Uh, Julie, how did it empower you as an author? I think um, what Suzanne was saying, Dr. Coven was, was saying, is that here she is sitting in her office and she's hearing this story. And she's also, she's hearing a story and she's telling a story. But she's also giving really great medical advice. And that's what we did in this collaboration with Chicken Soup at Harvard Medical School, is we wove really great cutting edge medical advice into the books and with the stories. And we think that's a very powerful combination. And it's exactly what happens in your office. Yeah, now everyone can have an appointment with a Harvard Medical School doctor. <laughs> that's right. So Marie, when you were putting together uh, your book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Boost Your Brain Power, which has a lot of complex neurological information, and we're all a little bit afraid of you because you're <laughs> a, a brain person. Um, but how did you find that the stories made it easier for you to convey the me medical information? Well, you know, I, I think neurology um, is often perceived as being um, very complex and, and, and somewhat intimidating. And so I think that the beauty of the stories is that they in the art of, of storytelling is that they not only provide comfort, but I think they also dispel fear. Mm -hmm. And they also make you know, material that could be quite daunting uh, more understandable. And what I love about my book is there's really an array of, of stories providing all kinds of advice on how you can keep your, your brain vibrant and, and healthy. And what, what I find so interesting, too, is um, just like every snowflake is different, every story is different. And for me, it really is a testament to the creativity and the resourcefulness of the, of the human mind. So that, that's I a, love the contributors. They bring, they brought in stories, and then that was a jumping off point for us, you know. Uh -huh, and uh -huh, it wasn't mm -hmm. the same kind of thing that you hear in your practice every day. Mm -hmm, yeah. I thought that was great to have the contributors um, that you all have from Chicken Soup, and just to read their stories and say, "That's what I hear in my practice. I, I love this story. Let me jump off from this and explain what I would actually do." I use the advice of our contributors all the time. In fact, in your book, Marie, there was a contributor who said. One way you could stimulate your brain is by going to a different grocery store. And my husband and I one day went to a different grocery store because we were told to, to stimulate our brains. <laughs> That's right. We didn't actually like it very much, but we did it. <laughs> and Suzanne's book, which is called Say Hello to a Better Body, has actually caused me to lose a few pounds and to focus a little more on my fitness routine. Suzanne, how did you enjoy using those stories? Well, you know, I, I have to confess, when I was first approached with the idea of a collaboration between uh, Harvard uh, Health Books and Chicken Soup for the Soul, I thought that that really sounded like strange bedfellows. And yet, um, as it evolved, I really thought this is, this is just a, a ingenious as a collaboration, um, because the medical information really comes to life through the stories, and the stories are really grounded by the medical information. Um, when I run a group, absolutely the most powerful moment comes when one patient says something and the patients around the table all nod and smile and shake their heads and say, oh, I thought I was the only one who ever thought mm -hmm. that. And uh, when I was reading the patient stories that are in my book, I was nodding, I was smiling. I thought, you know, what a clever idea that is. And um, I'm really looking forward to having people read it and have those kind of moments of, of recognition. Now, Jeff, you did two books with us. You did Say Goodbye to Stress. You've kept me busy. <laughs> yes. And Think Positive for Good Health. Uh, we knew you could handle two because you did say goodbye to stress. And, <laughs> that stress, that's right. One of the pieces of advice in there is when to say no. Uh, but I was wondering how you found the stories enabled you to give, to give better information to patients. And uh, have you used any of those stories in your practice, any of the stories oh, from the book? That's a great question. You know, I have shared uh, some of the stories in my practice. And uh, I think the thing that's uh, really key to that is that people are looking for, and 
I'm the same way, to be honest. I love reading those stories for, uh, for the book and sorting through them and figuring out where they fit in the book to make the most sense relative to the, to the, the advice that we were trying to provide for folks. Um, but it's very engrossing and it really normalizes how we feel about things. Uh, it lets me know that, like uh, Suzanne said, you're not kind of alone. Uh, it removes that isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, it was so key in that. I recall just a story just this last week that I shared uh, with a woman who was dealing with a considerable amount of depression and uh, just hasn't felt good in a long time. Um, a story that I shared with her came from actually another patient of mine, uh, not who's in the book, but in a, a, the, the power of storytelling. This woman that I'd seen previously had, um, had gone through a divorce. Her husband left her when, uh, when she was pregnant. Uh, she um, had a lot of complications with the pregnancy um, and she just you know had two kids already the key moment just like Suzanne saying when the nodding for me in, in in my practice key moments are when people share that insight and this woman said uh, she said I didn't realize how depressed I've been she said now that things are getting better water even tastes better to me and I thought <laughs> wow that is something that I take for granted every day but is that, that feeling of water even taste. So I taste better. So I shared that with this patient this week who she, she didn't know that things could get better, but there's powerful imagery with that. Uh, and it's, it's been fun writing these. It's been easy actually, because it's so easy to get engrossed in these stories that are powerful and transformative. You know what I love about what we're talking about here is this um, one-two punch, which is validation and empowerment. And that's mm -hmm. what we did in these books. We validated the, the um, stories that came in were so validating and people said, oh yeah, you know, I've experienced that and normalized it. But then we also offered this medical advice, this empowerment. And that is really what healing is all about. It's validation and empowerment. It's all right, this is, you know, this happened to me. How do I deal with it? I'm a breast cancer survivor. I wrote the breast cancer book. Um, and, you know, that is what healing is all about in breast cancer. It is a validation of a very difficult experience, but also an empowerment of, okay, what do I do next? Now I'm a breast cancer survivor. How do I heal? How do I get my life back? What do I do? Mm -hmm. Well, your books are both about pretty serious things. Hope and healing for your breast cancer journey is one of them, and the other is say goodbye to back pain, right. which can be incredibly debilitating exactly. and make someone into an invalid. So. Uh, I was thinking about what Jeff said about how the stories make you feel that you're not alone and I was thinking for your books that's very, very important because people don't know that there are hundreds of thousands of other patients going through the exact same feelings that they have. Right. And I think it's miserable suffering in silence and, and suffering alone and these books break down that wall mm -hmm. and let people feel connected. I think something I've always suspected but but um, writing this book uh, really validated for me is that I think in medicine we underestimate the prevalence of shame. Uh, and the number, particularly in what I do dealing uh, so much with women who have issues around weight, uh, something I'm familiar with in my own experience, uh, I always tell uh, I always tell my patients I'm not only the president of the hair club, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a member, uh, um, and the number of people who come to me with such deep shame, shame that I think we as physicians often feed into uh, by the way uh, we treat some of these issues, and storytelling is a great balm for shame. If someone else is also, um, you know, hiding the candy wrappers in the bottom of the garbage. It's a huge relief to know that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have stories from women who did hide, hide the candy wrappers and now don't. Yes. And that's very encouraging. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, because part of the shame is a feeling of helplessness. Well, I'm the only one in the world who has this problem and I am unique, uniquely unqualified to ever solve it, except that it turns out there's a lot of other people who have the same problem who have solved it. And that's the validation and the empowerment in the book. Right. So mm -hmm. the validation is, is understanding that shame and that process, not feeling helpless, and then taking the next step towards healing and, and not hiding the candy wrappers, not having the candy or, or having less of the candy mm -hmm. and not feeling bad when you do. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and I think the stories also have a wonderful way of allaying our fears. I know um, there's a story I love to share with, with my patients. Um, about a year ago, I, I saw this woman who came to see me and, and she was fearful that she was developing Alzheimer's disease. And so after performing routine tests and her evaluation, all of which proved negative, we, you know, we, we talked about her lifestyle and, and her living situation. And it was clear to me that she was simply socially isolated and wasn't getting any mental stimulation. She had recently retired and you know, it was, was very much alone. And so I offered some simple suggestions to her on you know, ways to rejuvenate her lifestyle. And when I saw her in follow-up, she was, she was like a new woman. She had reinvented herself. She had... Um, Gone to a new grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She'd done all those things. Didn't like it, but went. Right? I used so. to be 80. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, it was, it was just so, so wonderful to, you know, to see. And, you know, her memory problems were, were a thing of the past. And so to be able to, you know, to share that uplifting story with someone I'm seeing for the first time who's you know, really concerned that they have Alzheimer's disease and you know, letting them know that there are many factors that, that affect the, the way we think and the way we can remember. You know, it's, again, it's, it's so empowering. It, it allays fears. And for me as a physician, it's just very meaningful to be able to you know, share those type of stories with my patients. That reminds me, you, you gave her a simple tip and it changed her life, and that was one of the things that struck me about your books. They are filled with so many simple, easy to implement tips that can make such a difference. I think that three of you may have recommended eating blueberries. Very simple, but very powerful. But I, I did notice there were a lot of great tips in there. Well, you know, uh, we live in an age uh, that's full of experts, uh, and uh, that can be a good thing, um, and we like being experts, but uh, it can make the average person sometimes feel overwhelmed that they're not doing the right thing. And I think one of the beauty of these stories is um, these are just regular people who figured out that walking is better than sitting, um, or that um, you know, more fruit and less candy was a good idea. We sometimes overlook the obvious. I had a patient come to me the other day, menopausal weight gain. She wanted to know what I thought of the magic berry fat burner that she had seen advertised on late night TV. And I said, what do you think I think of it? <laughs> And uh, then we got to talking about what her alternatives might be. It turned out she lived across the street from an affordable health club, but she hadn't joined because she was looking for magic. And so many of these stories aren't about magic. They're about, you know what, I did this really rather ordinary thing, and it works. And I talk about in my book on breast cancer, um, literally just walking and talking. Um, you know, when I was going through treatment, I would get distracted if I was talking on the phone and I could actually walk a lot more than if I said, okay, I have to get on the treadmill and walk. So every time I, you know, had a phone call, I would just get on my treadmill or I'd pace the house or whatever. And now that I think about it, and when you talk about cell phone minutes and things, if you just use those cell phone minutes and you walk and talk, it helps you so much with all a lot of the different things. Mm -hmm. Decrease your stress, increase your, your neurocognitive functioning, your brain power, um, you know, help with your weight, and help with healing. So all of our books, just walk and talk. Simple, simple tips. Add up your cell phone minutes. See how you can use those minutes to walk and talk. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. And, and, it, and I think so many of these things have modest benefits, right. but kind of when you add them all together, the cumulative effect. Right. The synergy is, that mm -hmm. comes and the, the negative it's, it's synergy that happens when you don't do them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's, it's a real synergy that comes together with very simple little steps. I always believe in stringing together a bunch of singles instead of going for a home run. Yeah. That's, <laughs> what <you're doing. laughs> that's what you got with us. <laughs> 
You know, I think it's about breaking rules, getting out of, of the kind of the mindsets that we all can have. We get stuck and we're looking for new solutions. And again, as you're saying, maybe the benefits are only modest, but collectively they're very important and critical for changing our lives. Uh, I try to practice what I preach. I love working with the patients that come in my office because I'm always learning from them. And uh, that's what's the beauty of the beauty of these stories, again, is that the fact that they're sharing solutions that maybe none of us had thought of yet. You know, mm -hmm. we live in a, in a uh, culture of instant gratification and of excessive expectation so that uh, we undervalue incremental progress. Uh, I had, uh, my group is actually, uh, the one I'm doing now, actually has some uh, men in it, which has uh, really been a lot of fun. This is a cardiovascular uh, prevention group. And uh, one man uh, said the other day that he had only lost seven pounds in seven weeks. And I said, well, you know, pal, it seems to me you're on track to lose 50 pounds this year. And he said, oh, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> That's exactly right, and I just wrote about that in, in the breast cancer book. I was thinking about this idea of how, uh, what our expectations are. And we often expect healing or weight loss or whatever to happen at a certain rate. And really, what, if you, I used a metaphor with music. If you play music really fast, it doesn't really work. If you play music really slow, it doesn't really work. It's got to be at the right tempo. And so that's really what we're talking about is the right tempo, the right fit, and, and a pound a week, a pound a month, whatever that, whatever's the right tempo for, um, for people, that's, that's what healing is about. That's what we want to focus on. Well, and that's what these books are about in general, which is reasonable, accomplishable things that you can do to improve your health, your physical and mental well-being. Right. Things that are actually achievable by regular people and you have stories from regular people, but of course, exceptional doctors. <laughs> well, thank you. It's nice of you to say that. But, um, we, we actually feel like we're regular people, and you know, we studied medicine, and it's a lot of fun being here at Harvard Medical School and, and uh, you know, talking to our colleagues and, and sharing ideas and, and hearing from all of the, the people who contributed stories to Chicken Soup. It's been a great collaboration. We love it. I always say that I focus on getting stories from people who are not self-involved, they're not narcissistic. These are people who want to share, who want to improve themselves. And that's what we did to populate these books. We took these empowering, upbeat stories from positive thinkers. And everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. And I love hearing uh, different people's stories in my office or the different people that have written in. And I would encourage, if you've ever thought about contributing a, a story to Chicken Soup, do it. It's really a lot of fun. Yeah, and we're getting new people all the, all the time. Yeah. I want to thank you all for being here today. I've loved hearing this discussion of our books. I, as the publisher, am so proud of them, and I know you're all really proud and enthusiastic of them also, and I can't wait to get the reaction from our readers and hear about how they implemented all these simple tips and changed their lives. Well, thank you for the opportunity. This has been a lot of fun and a great collaboration with Harvard Medical School and Chicken Soup.